everyone. Welcome to Pop Culture Comics in Oakland Park, Kansas. I'm Captain Logan, and it's time for my comic book picks of the week. I'm going to be changing up the format a little bit. Starting this week, I'm going to be doing a DC book for the week, a Marvel book for the week, instead of uh, the old Cat Picks 3, and then I'm also going to be doing an indie book and a kid's book as often as possible. Uh, the DC relaunch began last week. Uh, the big onslaught of relaunch books begins this week. Uh, I'm going to be uh, showing you my favorite book for this week for the relaunch a little bit later. Let's start first with my Marvel book for this week, Spider Island The Avengers. This is a one-shot. Like all big events, Spider Island has several tie-ins, and many of them are one-shots. Naturally, you don't need to read this to understand what's happening in the story over in Amazing Spider-Man. It's a completely pointless diversion, and that's precisely what I love about it. It captures the light-hearted, bizarre, and silly hilarity of certain early Marvel books. Sometimes in the middle of a series, you'd have a total joke issue that doesn't play into the regular story at all, and is a totally different tone than normal, but is really funny and worth reading for a good laugh. That's just what we have here. And in fact, it borrows a character from one of those books, a Marvel team-up issue I happen to have, Frogman. And what a fun character to throw in all this chaos, just as all these people in New York are getting spider powers. Some of the Avengers assume he must have spider powers too, but he just has powered springs in his shoes. He just came out of nowhere and reminds everyone that he's around, that he used to be a reserve Avenger, and at one point, the book directly makes fun of those jokey comics when he says, it's the crazy mutant misadventures of Frogman and Miss Marvel. Meanwhile, Hawkeye has spider powers and keeps sticking to everything, which is driving him crazy. And a running gag is how he hates Spider-Man for constantly putting him in these ridiculous situations. And he's got a point. I love how much fun Yost had with this issue, going as far as putting silly editor notes in, like when the bad guy Flag Smasher declares, this is a bomb. And a note points to the huge device he's standing on top of and says, he's right, it's a bomb. Flag Smasher is the leader of an anti-government terrorist group that seems to just hate all governments on principle called Ultimatum. And there are even a couple jabs at the Ultimate Universe because of this, like when Flag Smasher refers to his spider-powered soldiers as Ultimate Spider-Men. There's also a mildly amusing subplot about Squirrel Girl babysitting a baby with spider powers. I really appreciate Marvel lightening up as much as they have this year and putting out an event that can get this goofy. Naturally, all of Spider Island isn't like this, and I wouldn't want it to be. But as dark and tonally heavy as Fear itself has been, I really appreciate this kind of variety. It won't be for everyone, but I love this kind of really goofy stuff mixed in with comics that are supposed to be taken more seriously. So that's why it's my Marvel pick for the week. At the end of the show, I'm going to give you some more recommendations for this week for the relaunch, but right now, it's time for my favorite relaunch book for the week. Uh, here is DC's Action Comics number 1 by Grant Morrison. Like everyone else who enjoyed All-Star Superman, I've been more than looking forward to Grant Morrison on Superman again, and his writing doesn't disappoint here. I've got to warn you, though, if you haven't read up on what's being done with Superman in this relaunch, you're going to be pretty surprised. This is not the Superman you knew. Interestingly, the one from five years after this, who we meet in Swamp Thing number one, feels much more like what we're used to, which means there's a huge change that happens for the character in his first few years in Metropolis. Yes, the air quote costume he's wearing on the cover is what he wears inside, too, and it works because he's flying by the seat of his pants, much more of a vigilante at this early point in his career rather than a superhero. And I use that phrase, fly by the seat of his pants is a euphemism because, like Superman in 1938, he doesn't fly. His powers are way dialed back here, and he's getting stronger over time, much like he does in the early seasons of Smallville. At one point, someone asks him if he can jump over the Metropolis Tower, and he says he's not sure, but he's about to find out. This is a Superman who has the same small-town values he's always had, yet the violence of Metropolis has changed him into an enforcer rather than the symbol he'll presumably become later. It'll be interesting to see what his relationship with Batman will be like, because they have far more in common here than they ever have. The issue opens with Superman threatening to drop a rich criminal off a building. We learn later that while he, of course, isn't killing anyone, he has gone as far as breaking bones throwing people into the river. He's appalled at the lack of humanity he's finding in people, and he threatens that if they don't start treating each other right, he'll be there. It's a scary notion, a Superman who seems willing to enforce his own idea of morality through violence. This is bound to put some Superman fans off, who might say that he's not the same person at all. Others, who have never been able to get on board with Superman, might appreciate this take because it seems like a more realistic, updated version, and he's much less powerful so it's actually plausible for an army to take him down. He's still bulletproof, but he's not flying yet, and I'm not sure he's quite gained all of his powers. And without spoiling what I thought was a surprising cliffhanger, Morrison makes a point to show us that he isn't completely invincible like we're used to. 
If Superman were being changed into just a misguided, superpowered vigilante for good, I'd be really against this. But I trust where Morrison seems to be going, and it really seems that we're going to see a fully fleshed out character arc for how Superman goes from this to a something more of the symbol of hope we're familiar with. I appreciate that while it's an origin story of sorts, it starts in the middle of things. He's already in Metropolis. Clark is already a newspaper reporter, working for a rival paper against Lois and Jimmy, by the way, but he and Jimmy are best friends and seem closer in age. And there's no talk yet of Krypton, only a little bit of Smallville and his upbringing on a small town farm. Morales' art is bold and the action is thrilling. As different as this is, it comes off as confident and completely comfortable with itself, as if to say, yeah, I know, but just keep reading. You won't be rolling your eyes when this is done. You can't be sure of anything after one issue, and so I hope Morrison pulls the whole thing off in a convincing way. But it's a courageous start, and I'm extremely intrigued, if nothing else. And now, kind of an oddball title for my indie book this week, here is Xenoscope's Grim Fairy Tales The Library, number one. Sela is the daughter of one of the richest men in the world, who got to be so rich because of his cold, calculating, ruthless attitude. He pays hardly any attention to his children, and Sela has everything, and nothing, because all she wants is a relationship with her dad. It's a familiar story, but an enduring and relatable one, and the art in this book helps elevate this above simple rehash. Knowing what's coming, this is just the setup for a romp around the world of classic literature. Sela's father takes her and her brother to a huge library he's bought, which she's about to turn into something else. So the books are about to either be moved on time or, as he tells the librarian, destroyed. I like how she stands up to him, too. She asks why, with his millions, he has to be like that when he could just pay to have them move faster. And he says he got rich by being that way. So she kicks him out, since the library isn't his until next week. Meanwhile, Sela finds an old spell book, and as you might expect, reads from it, causing a magic spell that creates a bunch of whirlwinds, which suck her and her brother into the book. It's a bit of a slow start, but I think it has promise. Sela seems like a real enough girl with real problems, and I'd like to see how that plays into the fantastic world she's found herself in. But I'm mostly impressed with the art, which is very realistic, and the scenes, especially toward the end, are quite cinematic. I'm looking forward to seeing how Timpano draws the monsters and heroes from literature. And finally, for my All Ages book this week, here is Atomic Robo, The Ghost of Station X, number one. This is my first foray into Atomic Robo, and I found it relatively easy to sink my teeth into. This story is a refreshing exercise in clever, sophisticated use of language and interesting problem solving. Remember the scene in Apollo 13 where the NASA team stands around trying to come up with a way for the lunar astronauts to save themselves using the limited resources available to them in their pod? This entire issue is like that, and with very little action to speak of, I found it entirely engaging. Brian Clevenger definitely has a way with words. Robot, by the way, being a robot with human emotions who owns his own company that apparently solves impossible problems, and many of the exchanges between he and his colleagues is a question that sets up a punchline, but much more sophisticated punchlines than your average sitcom. Robo is going to take a plane himself to rescue the astronauts by setting them in the correct orbit, because there's no way to get a shuttle to them in time, and his friends tell him there's a small window where Robo's plane won't melt. When Robo asks how small, another colleague says, and I quote, what kind of odds would you give a man juggling chainsaws that have smaller chainsaws for handles? Funny, unusual, clever, and makes you think. There's also a subplot, the setup for another mystery Robo will have to solve during the course of this miniseries, where a historical building in England is missing, and Robo being an old robot has some kind of history to it. At one point, the whole story stops so that two characters can discuss the probability of the entire universe being a holographic simulation in some other universe. I found this quirky and different, and I enjoyed all the ideas it gave me to think about. It's not a kid's book, but it's definitely safe for all ages, and I'm guessing the whole Atomic Robo series is that way, but again, I've never Ever read one before now. And it's a much more intellectual exercise than you'll find with most comics. It also has a grand sense of adventure. I highly recommend it. Well, I just realized so far I've suggested nothing but number ones this week. Lots of good jumping on points. Of course, that's just going to continue as DC's relaunching their entire line this month with 52 new number ones. In addition to my DC pick for the week, I'm also going to be suggesting three of the relaunch titles each week that I thought were really, were really quite good. And uh, I'm not going to talk about every one of them because there's just not enough time in the day or in the program. Uh, but anyway, uh, here is the list that's in the middle of uh, each DC title right now that uh, gives you the rundown of all the new books coming out 
and uh, what week they come out. And also, uh, your local comic book shop probably has one of these, which uh, gives you uh, additional information on uh, who's writing each, each uh, title, who's drawing each title, and a little bit about them. So uh, check that out if you, if you haven't yet and if you don't know what's going on. And, of course, you can find lists online and things like that. Uh, and so now, um, here are the other relaunch books that I, that I liked this week. Here is uh, Swamp Thing Number 1 by Scott Snyder and Yannick Paquette. Of course, uh, Yannick Paquette, the artist, fantastic, extremely well detailed. Um, this is naturally being Swamp Thing, all about nature. And the, uh, the drawing is quite exquisite, and it being Scott Snyder, it's also quite creepy. This is also a really good uh, thing to jump onto to uh, kind of bridge the gap between the, uh, you know, the continuity we were reading last month and, uh, and, and the new continuity, as it's you know, right off the heels of Brightest Day and everything that was going on there. And it's also uh, really good if you're reading other stuff right now, because it kind of gives you a little bit of a glimpse of, as I mentioned earlier, who the uh, Superman is right now versus the, the, the Superman we were reading with. Uh, with, with Grant Morrison in action. Uh, so that is the uh, other one that I highly recommend. In fact, it was between this and Action Comics number one for my DC pick this week. Um, also, recommending Static Shock. Uh, just a lot of fun. It's a great deal like the, uh, like the cartoon show was. He's in New York City, he's in over his head, and one of the things I really like about this is uh, that it, there, it seems to be kind of making fun of Marvel a little bit, because in the DC Universe, apparently, there aren't a lot of superheroes in New York, and uh, certain people are getting kind of irritated because Static Shock showed up, and now there are more superheroes in New York, and that used to be considered kind of a place where you didn't have to deal with superheroes. So far, this is about the most laid-back, light-hearted book of the relaunch, a lot of fun, really adventure -y. And finally, Justice League International number one, which is quite a bit different than I expected it to be, uh, because a lot of people were telling me that it was going to be breaking the trend of Justice League International being a, a, a silly, more jokey title, and it still has that. I mean, it's, it's maybe more serious than it was before, uh, but it's definitely jokey, definitely bantery, and uh, I really like the dynamic between uh, Booster Gold and Batman in this. A couple other things I want to recommend this week. Here is Wolverine Dead of Death. This is a one-shot. It's very late 80s type Wolverine storytelling, uh, really dark dark and gritty. It's an army story, it's a mystery story, definitely worth checking out. Here also is Spawn number 211. Uh, if you dropped this recently because you thought things were uh, not happening fast enough, uh, this is where to get back on board. It's uh, Things are starting to really come to a head between Spawn and Clown, and uh, some really fantastic artwork in this, some of the best in uh, this run so far. I think I've said that nearly every issue, but it's definitely true with this one. I also wanted to mention that uh, Marvel Select has a new Captain America First Avenger figure out. Really fantastic figure. Uh, we've got it here at Pop Culture Comics, and uh, it's quite neat. And also, if you are ever in the Kansas City area, be sure to check out Pop Culture Comics in Overland Park, Kansas. It's where I am at this very moment. It's my favorite place to get comic books. If you don't have a local comic book shop close to you, you can go to popculturecomics.com. You can uh, buy digital comics there. You can also read a lot of free digital comics, and uh, that's a good way to get some of the new relaunch titles if you don't have a, a good place close and you can't get them. Um, uh, be sure to support your own local comic book shop if you happen to have one. Thanks a lot for watching. I'm Captain Logan. Happy reading.